The fifth issue that we want to come to, or the sixth story now, we come to the sixth issue, is that we should understand, we should keep in mind, is that we've already mentioned that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will preserve this religion until Yawm Al-Qiyamah. This deen will remain intact, its beliefs will remain intact, its methodologies will remain intact, its usul will remain intact, and this is all by the presence of the ulama whom Allah has chosen, whom He has mobilized against the people of Bida and Dalala. But one thing that we should realize is that in any one given time, where we have, in it, no matter which century we are in, we could be in the 4th, 10th, 6th, but we are now in the 15th century. We see that in any one time, when we put all of the scholars of the sunnah together, we see that amongst themselves, all of them, they have refuted all of falsehood. All of falsehood. So for example, in our time, let's say, we have Sheikh uh, Al-Albani, rahimahullah, Sheikh Ibn Baz, rahimahullah, Sheikh Muqbil, rahimahullah, uh, Sheikh Ibn Baz, rahimahullah, Likewise before them, Sheikh Abdurrahman bin Nasr al-Sa'di rahimahullah. When we look at them, we see amongst them, and likewise the scholars who are alive, we see amongst them are those who refuted the atheists. Those who refuted the philosophers. Like al-Sa'di rahimahullah has some very good books he wrote in his time, refuting the, the, the malahida, the atheists and the philosophers and other than them. There were some really excellent books which he has. Likewise we see Ibn Baz rahimahullah, he refuted the communists, he refuted the... Zionists, he refutes the missionaries. He has a book here, Al Ghazw Al Fikri, the ideological attack against Islam. In this book, this really nice book, he explains this, this ideological attack in, against Islam. It comes from different groups of people. From them are the Christian missionaries, from them are the Zionists, and from them are the, the third group, the communists and the socialists. That these people have come to attack Islam and to attack the Arabs and to bring the, the ideological revolution against Islam. Likewise, we see amongst them those who refute the Sufis and the Rafida and the Jahmiya and the Muqallida, those who call to blind following of the Madahib. So the point being, and then they mention, and then they refute certain people by name. Like Al-Albani Rahimullah refuted. Who did refute? Abu Ghadda and Al-Buti and all these other people. So when we put all of them together, the scholars together, we see amongst them all, we see, walhamdulillah, that they have clarified all of truth from all of falsehood, from all of the innovations of the Rafida, Khawarij, Murjiya, Jahmiya, Mu'tazila, the Aqlaniya, the Sufiya, the people of Wahdatul Wujud. But we see that not every single scholar is refuting every single innovation. We see some scholars, they will speak about some because they specialize in that, and other scholars will speak about others. Right? This leads us on to a fundamental principle in our religion, which is what we call, and you will hear this word tomorrow in more detail, inshallah ta'ala, it is called Jarh Mufassar. Jarh Mufassar. Which is called a detailed criticism. A criticism which is produced with evidence. This is fundamental in our religion because of a practical and physical reality that we simply cannot escape, which is that there is no one scholar, there is no one scholar who can encompass all of truth and all of falsehood on his own. This is why I said, this is why I said that when you, that the truth of Islam at any one time is embodied amongst all of the scholars collectively. They will all have something of the truth and they will all have something of contribution towards clarification of the truth and of falsehood. And it was never, ever, ever a principle in Islam that in order for something to be falsehood, that every single scholar had to agree upon it. Let me ask you a question. Did every single scholar in the time of Imam Ahmad refute the Jahmiyyah and write books on the Jahmiyyah? Answer? Answer? There were tens of thousands of scholars who were put to trial in the fitna of the Qur'an. How many of them actually wrote books? How many? How many books do we have? You know, we can, we can list maybe, I have a list here of maybe 120 books that have come to us, there is. Maybe there are others. But considering there were hundreds of thousands of scholars who were present, not every, not all of them wrote and authored books in refutation of the people. So the point being is that the reality is that not every single scholar can encompass all of falsehood. Just like not every single scholar can encompass all of the truth in every single issue. For that reason, there are principles in the deen of Islam that ensure that the truth is not lost. 
And one of those principles are, is that when we receive the news of a trustworthy person, meaning here a trustworthy alim, who informs us, who knows, who has basira, who has insight, that this is falsehood, this is batil, or that this person is a mubtil, he is upon falsehood, then it is from our principle of religion that we accept that from him as long as he brings evidence. Even if there are a hundred people who say otherwise. Let me give an example. There's a person called Abdullah. Person called Abdullah. We have two people. One person says about Abdullah, I see him in the masjid for Fajr. I see him in Dhuhr. I see him in Asr, Maghrib, and Isha. Likewise, I see him rushing to be righteous to his parents. Likewise, I see him giving charity all the time. I see him going to Umrah every year. All I know from this man is khair and goodness. By Allah, this man is a pious, righteous man, and he never keeps company with any of the people of sin and disobedience and so on and so forth. Then the second person, and both these people are trustworthy and honest. Second person says, well, you know what? I saw him last week. And I saw him with, whatever example it could be, I saw him coming out of this place, and with him was a woman, dressed in a certain way, whatever, and I saw him do such and such, whatever. So what you've, what you've seen from him, I've seen something else. Is there a contradiction here? Is there a contradiction? No, there isn't. There isn't a contradiction. Because one person has additional knowledge that the other person doesn't have. There isn't any contradiction. You put all of that together, you have a fuller picture of that individual. You have a fuller picture of that individual. One person sees piety, righteousness, and so on and so forth, but another person has seen something else. So now, in this issue, whose, posi- whose view do we take? Whose view do we take? Person two. Person two, right? If this principle, were, if this wasn't a principle of our religion, do you think that the deen of Islam would have remained as, as pure as it is now? Do you think it would have? What are the implications of rejecting this principle? What are the implications? Yes? Yeah. Ah. The implications of this principle, of not accepting this principle, is that we have to take all the books of the Salaf and throw them in the fire. This is what the implication is of this principle. Because it means now we have wronged all of those innovators who are mentioned in the books of Hadith, who are mentioned in the books of the, of the Sunnah, that they were spoken of by so many of the Imams of the Salaf. It means that we have to throw all those books away, throw them away. Why? Because those people have, you know, we, if we don't accept this principle, we have to basically undermine the very deed of Islam. We have to undermine the very deed of Islam. Because if we are going to say, well, actually, no, uh, all we know from this guy is good, and that opinion of that person is just something that's, you know, contradictory and whatever else, we can't accept it. This now means that the whole of history, that we have wronged all of the innovators. We have wronged Wasil bin Atta. We have wronged Amr bin Ubaid. We have wronged Bishr al-Marisi. We have wronged... Why? Because these people wrote about Islam. They defended Islam in certain respects. They, you know, who says they don't, don't, don't have good, good issues? You know, every... There's no Muslim you'll find except that he has good in him. So this means that we undermine the very thing which protects the religion from that which occurred to the Jews and the Christians. So this means that... So the point that we're making here is, as I was saying, that when we take all of the scholars in any given time, we see that, we see that all of them will refute something of falsehood to a great or lesser amount, even though there are some who are unique in refuting a specific falsehood. Like in the time time of the Salaf, we see that some of the Imams of the Salaf, they wrote works on certain groups, but not what other, other scholars didn't write. Let me give an example. The, 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 the scholar in the 5th century, Abu Nasr al-Sijzi, rahimahullah, he wrote a book on Ibn Qulab and al-Ash'ari, refuting them on the issue of the Qur'an being the speech of Allah, and Allah's speech being al-harf wa sawt, letter and, 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 and voice. There is no other book you will find, Allahu A'lam, where you will find that these two individuals, Ibn Kullab and Al-Ashri, are refuted by name in this detailed manner. No, no, nowhere else. In that particular manner. So this shows that it is not the case that every alim has to come along and every alim in the dunya has to refute that person before now we come to accept the criticism. No. 
when an alim comes, he brings proof and evidence, then it is upon us to, to accept that proof and evidence.